Gary Nolan from the University of Telecom. I'm going to discuss current gravity, GKM dynamics, and so Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone involved in the organization here. And thank you for helping build the suspense as well. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to talk to you about some work that's been ongoing for a while with Juan Pedraza in Madrid, and that should hopefully be out sometime this month. Uh, it involves Carol, uh, but not in the way you saw this morning in the context of flat space holography. So I'll talk a bit about Carol geometry. Uh, but I'll try to connect it to something in gravity known as BKL dynamics, which has recently appeared in the context of holography, which I guess is my motivation for talking about it here in particular. All right. So the plan is as follows. I'll first introduce this uh, idea of BKL limits, and the Kastner geometries that are closely re related to it in the familiar context of Einstein gravity. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about Carroll limits and the, the, the effect it has on the Lorentzian geometry that we're all familiar with. Um, again, related to what we saw this morning, but in a different context, because we'll take this limit directly in the uh, Einstein theory of gravity that we'll talk about in the first part. So this is a bulk Carroll limit. Um, and in the models that we obtain, um, we'll be able to reproduce a particular kind of PKL dynamics known as a mixed master model. So that's the plan. Uh, let me know if the microphone is, is weird, it's a bit echoey. Um, all right, but first let's talk about these Kastner geometries. So these are very simple solutions to just vacuum Einstein equations, uh, where the only dependence is uh, on time. So there's spatial homogeneity, uh, but all the directions in space have a different scaling exponent. So this is anisotropic geometry. And you can visualize it using, for example, this ball, which could represent uh, uh, the spatial directions, which expands uh, in a different way in all of the different spatial directions in time. Now, that of its own is perhaps not a super interesting uh, solution to study. Uh, but you can make it more interesting by adding some dynamics in the space of these scaling exponents. I'll talk about that in more detail later. Uh, but basically what happens is that you get very rich and potentially even chaotic dynamics. Um, and this has been known for a long time. It's an old story from going back to the 60s and 70s. And one particular model that has been studied a lot and we'll try to reproduce from this Carroll limit is known as the mixed master model. Um, and in the sort of historical context of this is that this funny chaotic dynamics is conjectured by these BKL authors to be generic in GR, near space-like singularities. So for example, in this uh, space-time diagram, anytime you zoom into uh, a space-time region that looks approximately like this, the, the idea is that GR should reduce to this kind of rich but, but solvable dynamics. All right. so. Why am I talking about this now? Um, in this sort of ADS-CFT context, the, the, this Kastner BKL behavior has recently reappeared in various models that, that you're all very familiar with. Um, so motivated by that, we wanted to look at how you could uh, perhaps get new models by using these Carroll limits, uh, where, you, where you modify the Lorentzian structure in a way that is similar to what you could expect happens in the ultra-local limits you get near black hole singularities. So this kind of diagram will come up a lot, where the causal structure of Lorentzian space-time collapses to exhibit some ultra-local behavior sort of motivated by uh, the strong gravitational pull near space-like sing singularities. And as we'll see, uh, we'll be able to reproduce some of these models from, from just Carroll limits and hopefully go beyond them as well. All right. Um, so again, from an ADS-CFT uh, context, uh, one thing that you one way that you can easily see that these geometries appear in natural settings is by taking just a planar ADS black hole and zooming in far behind the horizon. So then, approximating the geometry, you get and, and doing an appropriate change of variables, you get something that is in fact a Kastner geometry. So far behind the horizon of a planar ADS black hole. It's a Kastner geometry with a particular value of the scaling exponents. And that is, that, that, that's good because uh, these have to satisfy, for this to be a solution to the Einstein equations, two sets of constraints, which of course these exponents in this case also satisfy. 
Right. So, zooming in behind the horizon of a planar ADS black hole, you get a Kastner geometry. But that's just one solution, right? That's not very interesting on its own. Um, to see this more rich dynamics, it's useful to use uh, slightly different uh, coordinates. So in particular, I want to slightly generalize the metric ansatz we had before, introduce some kind of laps in the time direction, and some scaling exponents in the other spatial directions. And roughly speaking, the derivatives of these scaling exponents with respect to time are going to be these Kastner exponents we just had. Yeah, but it's going to be useful to keep it around uh, to simplify the equations later. But yeah, absolutely. All right, so plugging this into the Einstein equations, in particular the TT exponent, uh, reveals something interesting, saying namely that the derivatives of these betas have um, to satisfy some equation, which suggests that there is some kind of Minkowski structure lurking around. Now, this ultimately comes from, if you want, the Wheeler DeWitt. Uh, structure of the Einstein equations. Um, but what this equation just at face value is telling you is that these betas the, can be interpreted as some kind of null vector in, in some external three-dimensional Minkowski superspace. Um, and this is an observation that goes all the way back to Schittre in the 70s. And also the, this whole story is very much uh, sort of motivated by this cosmological billiard story of 20 years ago. So Corresponding to a given Kastner geometry, we have some null uh, vector in a Minkowski superspace. And in fact, if you look at the other Einstein equations, uh, this vector is really uh, supposed to be a, a null geodesic. Uh, so a null geodesic, sorry. So just a straight line in this external um, Minkowski space. So again, that's not super interesting yet. Um, but uh, to understand the following pictures, it's then useful to project this motion onto, for example, the future hyperbola. Just any two-dimensional slice will do, basically, in this future light cone. So a, uh, a particular Kastner geometry corresponds to a point, for example, in this future hyperbola. And what we're after is interpreting uh, or obtaining some kind of interesting dynamics in the space of Kastner geometries which alternatively can be described as a motion in this future hyperboloid or some other two-dimensional slice of it. All right, so how do we get some interesting motion? Um, so there's basically two ways that, that you can modify this, this dynamics. First, you can introduce spatial curvature, so curvature on the spatial slices of your initial setup, or you can couple uh, this so far vacuum theory to, to matter. And one famous example, again, dating back to the, the 70s, is if you take the spatial manifold to be a SO3 group manifold. Uh, so you just use the modern Cartan forms associated to that, and basically you stuff these um, scaling exponents in the matrix. Um, and the result of putting this in the Einstein equations is that you now get a potential for the motion of this particle in the space of scaling exponents. And again, so projected on this, this slicing of uh, the external uh, space, you then get uh, not just pure null geodesic motion, but some kind of null geodesics that bounce around in this cone due to the potential that the spatial curvature introduces. Um, and in this particular case, you get a triangle in the corresponding hyperbolic space. Um, and the chaotic dynamics that results from the particles or the solutions bouncing a lot around in, 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 in this uh, diagram is known as the, the, the mixed master behavior that Misner observed at that time. And again, this relates, uh, this is a chaotic uh, classical dynamics, and then the BKL con conjecture is that this kind of dynamics is, is generic near singularities. All right, that's the setting that we're trying to make contact with. Uh, and how has this appeared recently in holography? Well, you can take a very normal uh, ADS -CFT, applied ADS-CFT model, like this charge massive scalar, um, and, and do the same thing that I, I sketched before, just zoom in behind the horizon. And then Hartnell and Horowitz and Jorat Kutov and George Santos observed in a series of papers with other collaborators as well, that you get very non-trivial dynamics uh, behind the horizon, even with relatively simple matter coupling, such as this one. Here they observed many of these Kastner bounces corresponding to different Kastner epochs, but eventually it settled into some uh, final state. So not the chaotic dynamics that we just saw. 
Um, and recently, in December last year, uh, the same uh, group of collaborators, a uh, related group, uh, put out a different model where, uh, okay, it looks maybe slightly less natural, but if you couple uh, gravity to three gauge fields uh, with some mass to have asymptotically ADS solution, um, then you can uh, reproduce the same mixed master uh, dynamics that, that we just saw on the previous slide. So this is the ADS-CFT uh, model where you can, by zooming in behind the horizon, obtain, uh, using a given ansatz, this, this, this same interesting uh, dynamics. And so this is holographically potentially interesting, right? Because there's, from a classical setup, um, a lot of chaotic dynamics going on, and you could hope that this maybe has something to do with, with black hole microstates. We'll, we'll get back to that later. Okay, I see I have to move quickly. <laughs> The Carroll uh, story connects in this in the following way. Basically, if you have a Lorentzian space-time diagram, um, then you can think of doing this ultra-local limit that we saw this morning, and that basically ends up not modifying space. The, the Carroll boosts that result from the Lorentz boost don't modify space anymore, and they don't modify the direction of, of time. Now, this is a very sort of non-obvious thing to do, except perhaps motivated by flat space holography. Uh, I won't go into that much because we already saw it this morning. Um, but we'll use this directly in the context of GR. So just think of you know, some uh, reference frame that you'd like in some Lorentzian space-time. And imagine doing this limit on the level of the geometry. Then what you obtain, um, what you can obtain is, is sort of a curved notion of this, this Carroll geometry that, that we saw sort of in a static sense before. Uh, where, due to the symmetries that, that, that you result, the, the, the metric sort of splits in two objects. You have a time vector field, this V, and you have some spatial notion of, of metric that is degenerate. Um, so that together can be used to describe space-time geometry curved, uh, fully general, just like we do in the Lorentzian case. And uh, one example that we'll see a lot is this, this Kastner uh, sort of implementation as a Carroll geometry, where you just have some time coordinate and you have the same scaling exponents hidden in the, the spatial metric. All right, um, so just to say that this is really like uh, a type of geometry that you can treat just like we uh, treat Lorentzian geometry. You can introduce a connection that's compatible with these metric objects. You can introduce a curvature associated to this connection. The perhaps only slightly weird thing is that this connection typically has torsion, um, and the torsion is related to the extrinsic curvature of this spatial slice in the geometry. So that's an object we'll see a lot. It's just how this uh, spatial slice is embedded in the whole space-time. All right. So through some well-defined procedure, we can obtain uh, the leading order limit from uh, a Carroll uh, expansion of, of, of just the Einstein-Hilbert action. And that gives an action just involving this extrinsic curvature, basically, that's uh, appeared in, in, in several places over, over the non-Lorentzian literature. Uh, so you can determine the equations of motion of this action and split it, as we sometimes do in GR, in constraint and evolution equations. So these are constraints, and this is the evolution equation. And if you compare that to the usual ADM-like um, decomposition of the Einstein equations, you'll see that, crucially, the spatial curvature is completely missing. That just drops out that leading order in this Carroll ultra-local limit. And as a result, if you adapt your coordinates to this V, this is just the ODE in the time coordinate. So the evolution equation, which is you know, typically the source of a lot of rich physics, but also a lot of pain, uh, is now just the ODE that we can easily solve. Um, and again, uh, this Kastner geometry that I sketched before is just a solution to these equations of motion. So it, it seems to capture at least this physics that we're interested in at the moment. Okay, but does it capture this rich uh, dynamics as well? So for the last few minutes, let me just try to sketch how you could do that. So we can basically take the same model from uh, the Hartnell and Company paper uh, last year, a couple leading order Carroll gravity to some Carroll limit of young mills. This is known as electric because it basically just involves the uh, electric field strength, which is leading in, in this limit. Um, so here you can uh, write down the, east, the 
constraint and evolution equations again, and now there's sources on what used to be the, the empty right-hand side. And there's just a normal equation of motion for this gauge field as well. So that's good, then we can hopefully source some interesting dynamics. Now, uh, in this setup, if we take some spatially homogeneous ansatz, similarly to this beta stuff we saw before, um, then we again get a potential for the dynamics of, of uh, the scaling exponents of this solution, which if we, we, we just plot this ODE numerically, gives you exactly um, this uh, uh, dynamics that we saw before from the holographic model. All right, so we reproduced the, uh, the, the holographic setup that already existed, but why should we do this, right? Now, the key thing, again, is that this evolution equation is an ODE to begin with. That doesn't depend on the fact that the spatial uh, metric was assumed to be homogeneous. So using these Carroll models, we can do more things. We can study spatially inhomogeneous models. Um, and, and, and again, obtain a solvable set of equations where you can allow the, the, the metric exponents to vary over space. And, and we hope that this will give a, a much richer set of models where we can actually obtain uh, the dynamics. All right, so just to summarize in, in the final uh, 10, 12, 15 seconds, we, we saw that there is an intimate relation between these mixed master limits and, and the ultra local. Uh, limits of GR that we've studied before. Now, there's also subleading corrections to this. Uh, so it suggests that there's a rich set of models where we can easily solve the, the resulting dynamics. Um, so that's what we're trying to do, incorporating the spatial uh, inhomogeneity and looking at what next to leading order corrections can do. Um, well, it would be very interesting to see if this connects to other things as well, but I'll leave it here. Uh, is there a boundary observable that uh, in the CFT that would be sensible to uh, the Kastner behavior? So, I definitely don't know of one. I, I, as far as I understand this holographic work that I cited before, the motivation is, well, to, to, to a sense it seems like it was a bit of a surprise that this, uh, this Kastner BKL story appears in these relatively simple models already. Uh, so at the moment, at least, I am just looking at what happens in, in, in the bulk. Uh, but it would be super interesting to, to understand what, yeah, what, what, what boundary observables could probe this, right? I mean, we just heard something complex that goes behind the horizon, but as you know but better. Maybe there is a connection with, uh, maybe you know there is this paper by Sacieta and company on trying to understand the microstates of black holes precisely from dynamics in the interior. So maybe that could be a Okay, yeah. I should say maybe that, well, I, I briefly mentioned that, oh, there's some chaotic dynamics going on here. I'm told that apparently that if you quantize this using just, uh, yeah, naive quantization, then the kind of chaos you get is, is not the right kind of chaos that you would expect from, from this horizon stuff that I'm trying to connect. It's arithmetic chaos instead of exponential rams of area. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned cosmological billiards a few minutes ago in the talk, so I'm just wondering, here you've got Carroll, Cac Moody algebras coming up, right? And at the same time, this cosmological billiards, billiards story is, you know, you mentioned Nikolai and Dermore, that's a lot of stuff saying that E10 arises in BKL. Have you any thoughts on that, or have you looked into that? E10, the Cac Moody algebra. Yeah, no, so absolutely. So there's a rich story with the symmetries of these domain walls that, and the, the domains where the dynamics arises. Um, and in this cosmological billiard story, the, the ultra-local limit is sort of taken on shell. And what we're building here is sort of off-shell toolkit for, um, uh, for, 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 for studying these limits. Um, now, in principle, we should be able to do this for any matter setup, including supergravity setups. Now, somebody might talk about this later this week, but doing Carroll limits of Lorentzian structures like you know, supergravity is not super obvious. There's been a lot of work uh, on this by people like Johannes in the audience. So, in principle, I should say we would be able to reproduce those models, but you know, the proof uh, is in the pudding. So. <laughs> 